welcome uh, all of the members of the school board uh, here to uh, spend some time with us, some valuable time. Especially want to welcome uh, Dr. Boone Thank you. here. You may have been to a couple of these meetings in the past. I did. I, I had a chance I, to sit in the gap. <laughs> okay. Well, now you're at the table with us. I guess that's good. You know. Thanks. So, but we look forward to having a lot of good meetings with you, Dr. Boone. We, I think the, my impression is, and I think it's widely held that you're off to a great start. So, so good for you. So, um, why don't I, I begin by asking the chair, Rodney? You have some. Did you want to say, or you want to know? No, just, just thank you. Uh, you know, you all had reached out to us back in August, and we were in the middle of the superintendent search, and so we're just pleased that now that we're able to complete that and have Dr. Boone on board to have the opportunity to dialogue with you today, and we're sure we'll be back soon uh, as the budget process uh, works its way through. So we'd just like to thank you again for the invitation, for the opportunity to talk about those things that we share and how we can work together to accomplish the goals that we've set out. Okay. If anyone else has a word. Dr. Bill. Good, good afternoon again, and, and thank you, both council and the school board, for the opportunity to be here early on in, in my tenure in Norfolk. And, and as you said, uh, I intend to be here for a while. And um, so we... <laughs> You know, I'm most appreciative of the welcome and the support that I receive from the city, particularly working with city manager Marcus Jones and, and others and council members. Uh, we will be, I will be scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings with council members in the coming weeks so that we can get to know each other also. Um, while I have familiarity with a few council members, um, there are others that, that certainly I, I want to get to know in this process. But again, the, the support of the city as I've come into the district has been uh, very much appreciated and has been offered in a, in a very genuine manner. And, you know, I, I think one of the things I said on the day that I was announced and the same day that I, same thing I said on the day of my swearing in, I'm here to make a difference in the lives of the children in this community. And when our, we have a strong public education system in our communities overall, and the city of Norfolk will be strong also. And so I want to be part of the, the thriving community through our schools, to be part of um, the conversations of how do we enhance education to improve a lot of other challenges that we have in the city and how do we use education as a marketing tool for our city in, in a very positive way. So those, those, that's where I'm headed in terms of um, the work with the city and the schools. And, and uh, so, Mayor, members of council, and members of the school board, Dr. Boone and I talked uh, uh, a lot lately. I will say that uh, she is a football fan, so be careful of calling her on Sundays, depending on you know, what team is playing. I won't out her for her favorite team. Uh, but uh, one thing that we, we did say is that it would be great we have these meetings that we can talk about how the, the school system and the city work together. And what we do have, council, is one of the six priorities of the city is lifelong learning. And so with lifelong learning, it's uh, more than just K-12 to education. It's uh, zero to 100, and I guess if we follow uh, John Martin with the, this new bonus that we have, maybe zero to 120 years old. But the concept is, how can we partner on many levels, and not just what's the line item that goes into a budget. So with lifelong learning, a few things that the city is partnering with the, the school system I'd like to highlight before I turn it back over to Dr. Boone is uh, starting off with the, the Norfolk Emerging Leaders. So we have approximately 250 students that each summer are working with the city in a, a variety of different uh, positions. And when you start to add the fellows and the uh, interns, we get close to 275 individuals. Uh, Public Works, I think the, the council, you'll recall a few years ago, you allowed each city employee, full-time employee, to have a half a day that you can volunteer to Norfolk Public Schools. Uh, David Ricks, the uh, Director of Public Works, I think he, uh, he took it to, to a new level. He actually took the folks from Public Works, adopted the school, uh, went in and had one-on-one -on -one mentoring. He did a, a We Are Public Works Day. We had um, actually a capital improvement project entitled How I Would Improve My Community. 
I think the, the most important uh, drill that he did is that he actually showed how the individuals from Public Works fill a pothole. And the reason I say that is important is because we do something as team building with the city, we call it day in the life. So each one of your deputies, each one of your directors have actually filled a pothole. And I would tell you, it's not an easy task, okay? <laughs> but that's, that's what's happening outside of just the budget discussions that we have in terms of this lifelong learning. United for Children, this council has um, put together approximately $400,000 over the last couple of years with United for Children. And that doesn't uh, include the, the different entities, not just the departments in the city, but the faith-based community and all of the, the folks that are throughout the city that are helping with this cause. So that's something that is a collaborative effort. <coughs> Mayor, your Commission on Poverty Reduction, where we had the Vice Mayor and Council Member Pertzier as being co-chairs, it's very important that there are four areas. One is early childhood education, another is youth career pathways, another is adult workforce development, and then finally neighborhood revitalization. So conceptually, there are so many additional opportunities to touch, you know, to interact with Norfolk Public Schools, again, not just around this table. And then lastly, I think um, it's pretty important to talk a little bit about what's evolving in terms of military families. So the uh, Military Child Education Coalition, or the, the, the MSAC, is basically a worldwide nonprofit organization that's focusing on educational opportunities for children. Mayor, I believe it was last month, Jill Gaten came in and she uh, briefed the Military uh, Economic uh, Development Advisory C Council and it was a very good briefing. So what we have is this great opportunity to connect the military families with the school system as well as the community. I introduced Bonnie <coughs> Baker to you last month. Bonnie is our military uh, liaison, and she's working with Jill. And I believe that both Jill and Bonnie had a meeting with yep, you great uh, meeting. earlier this month. So there are a lot of good things that are going on in terms of collaboration. and. As we continue to have these meetings, Dr. Boone and I will try our best to make sure that we're giving you a taste of some other things that are going on with, with the city and the school systems that there. Yeah, that's, that's very fair. And if I can just comment on, on the piece of the support with the military families. It is, it is I just happened to be at a conference last <coughs> weekend, weekend before last, and saw the other Tom Brady who's who runs the Department of Defense Schools. And I was able to talk about the meeting with Bonnie and Jill and where we're headed with the schools as it relates to support of our middle, military children and families. One of the, the um, pieces that you will see emerge through the budget that I will be presenting to the school board is a focus on what, I, what we term, not the final term that would necessarily be in the budget document, but the wraparound services. How are we supporting children and families in a way to be successful? I always characterize it this way. We're best at teaching and learning, and community organizations and, and entities, faith-based organizations, are best at supporting children and families. And our military families are, are certainly part of that, how do we making sure that, that we're supporting in a strong fashion. And so I will be doing some intentional carving out of responsibilities, not as a partnership coordinator, but really the deeper conversations and the deeper leadership around making sure that the other things that our students need to be successful are being considered and that they are being addressed through the relationships we, we build with the city as it relates to the military, children, and families, as well as other entities around the, the, the city, United for Children and others. We don't want any opportunity to close gaps for our children to slip through the cracks. And so, um, and we also want to build on those areas where we've identified additional gaps that we need support. And so that's one of the things that you will see come through uh, reprogramming of positions within the budget. So I, I appreciate uh, the city manager uh, addressing um, the lifelong learning piece because it's so refreshing for me to be in a community that recognizes that learning is part of its core being. And whether it's, and the public schools don't represent that entire piece of learning. So it's, it's really exciting to see how we'll continue to build um, partnerships and relationships to, to support that lifelong learning piece. 
in I, I presented to the school board um, earlier this month my 30-day assessment and my 100-day entry plan. And I will say to council today that um, I'm not here with any grand marketing sign or something different that we're going to do or some grand whatever for Norfolk Public Schools. You know, there's a lot of work that we need to strategically align and do, and that's exactly what we're focusing on. You know, our budget will definitely reflect where we value in terms of where we pay, place our investments of how we intend to move student achievement forward. We're certainly focused on, um, as we've broken ground this month on two new schools and prepare to open two other schools this fall, that's a big part of the work that we're, we're uh, paying attention to. Building, listening, learning, and connecting is, is, is what we have been addressing since I, I've arrived and what I will continue to do over the next 100 days. And truthfully, that's always what will happen. That's for a superintendent, and from my perspective, that's a continuous learning cycle that I all, will always be involved in. Um, we've paid attention to um, what, what's working in the district. That's what we're, we're understanding, what's working in the district and where are the areas of challenge and the places that we need to significantly address and, and make some adjustments for success. That's going to be critically important um, for our future success. We've been building the relationships at the state level also because it's important just as we partner with the city and, and in a true relationship and not just because we have to come together occasionally. But the same thing has happened with the Virginia Department of Education and our work around what it takes to successfully turn around schools. I have respectfully said to, to a couple of folks at the state level that Virginia's process doesn't work for me and I'd be glad to share my experiences and what does. And so they've been open to, to that conversation and, and, and us working toward that goal. So there's, I've positioned the district that our work going forward we're in district and school redesign. And that's not about moving chairs on the deck. That's about what happens within our schools, our mindset, our climate, our culture, our student achievement focus. Um, how do we close all of those opportunity and achievement gaps for students? And so our redesign will continue to emerge. It's funny because I, I sit here before council, I think in my eighth week, I think today represents the eighth week that I, that I started in Norfolk. And it's been a fast-paced uh, eight weeks, and it seems like I've been here a lot longer. But making, of course, the, the budget and, and that process accelerates that learning curve in terms of where we are and what our needs are. And in just a minute, I just want to share with council what we shared with the school board recently as it relates to uh, early planning for our budget, what we know in terms of the governor's proposed budget and, and where our needs are and, and what our opportunities are. But in general, you know, for me, it's about leading closer to the work, about getting results. Um, I'm less concerned about a banner flying on the building that says X, Y, and Z, and I'm more concerned about everyone being able to celebrate when we've moved the needle on some opportunities. So um, I know some people, not necessarily council, but there, there are some who have been waiting for this big whatever model of whatever we're going to do we'll talk about going forward what we're working on and how we intend to address it and not worried about a catch name for it. It's really about doing the work in a meaningful way. The last piece, and we have a, I have a, I bought a, a hard copy for council and another copy for board members as we've um, done it. Uh, I want to acknowledge members of the senior team, uh, executive cabinet that are here, and especially uh, Dr. Thornton, who has done a yeoman's job in shoring up and creating stability um, in the district during this interim period. And uh, as he continues to, to be a, provide the strong leadership around finance and operations, um, at the January 6th work session, we provided to the board information on our early assessment of the impact of the governor's budget, proposed budget on um, for Norfolk Public Schools. And none of this will be new to, to council, but I want to just share a little bit of the thinking that has emerged, emerged through this process. 
and the fact that um, our current budget, approved budget, is uh, roughly 314, almost $315 million represents our current budget. There was an interesting article that um, I read this morning, VSBA sent out, and it was an article published in the Washington Post yesterday, and I shared it with members of the executive cabinet, discussing the impact that the recession and decisions that were made regarding educational financing has had for schools in Virginia. One of my greatest shocks and ahas when I returned to Norfolk or, and through the process was the fact that here I have 7,000 more students than I had in Worcester, but I have $24 million less in money. And if, when you read that article, and I'll share it with uh, city manager, when you read that article, while it, it, it's very clear that there were some decisions that were made that were couched and presented as one-time decisions, but they have now actually become structural changes in the finance and the public education in the state. And we, we're truly lagging. It is, it is a very, very difficult situation that we find ourselves in. And I know mayors and chairs in the Crescent area have signed off on letters about funding. So the governor proposes uh, re-benchmarking, one, because it's the time that we do it every two years, and, and some other pieces in the budget. But statewide, the gap in public education funding is huge. And over time, and sooner than later, we've got to figure out how we help push the state along also in, in its support and funding for public education. But on the um, next couple of slides, um, we begin our base planning. We began our base planning, because we're well into the budget development. We began our base planning with a, a $6.7 million deficit due to one-time funds that were used for the current budget. So as we planned for FY16, um, there, there were two um, pots of money that, that created that 6.7 that closed significant budget gaps for the current fiscal year. And those were uh, prior year CTI funds for technology purchases and then reappropriation of $4.4 .4 million in carryover funds. So we use that, again, as our place. One of the things I've been very successful with in my, my former district is utilizing zero-based budgeting as a means of building a budget, particularly in difficult budget times. Unfortunately, I can't get to as much of that in this first round because the time between December and having a budget before school board in March is so truncated. But we are beginning to think about how we program dollars to to do things differently, recognizing that there's not a significant pot of new money. Actually, there are greater deficits going forward. So, the, so Governor McAuliffe, in his budget, proposed um, the, as I said, the rebenchmarking and as we, turning over the, the key recommendations were updates to the SOQ funding and direct aid, and the incentive and categorical funds, the new sales tax revenue estimates new composite indices for, for the 14-16 biennium, as well, based on the 14-16 biennium, increase in the employer, our district uh, contributions paid to the Virginia retirement system, and funding for additional school-based positions. It's important to note, however, this does not include any raises at state contribution toward raises in the first year of the biennium. The state revenue, so when we look at all of those assumptions in the governor's budget, we actually stand to gain through the SOQ adjustments primarily because we have a little bit of a loss of funding and incentive and categorical and lottery funding. But when we look at all of that coming together, the district stands to, to gain an increase of $6.7 million in revenue. So that essentially offset the beginning deficit that we had based on the one-time funds that we used in the budget. So that's the good news, is that we closed that gap. The challenge is we now have no money for growth and other needs and services and programs that, that we have. Um, the, the major variables that are impacting the Norfolk 
budget based on the state of the student enrollment projection, the local composite index changes, re-benchmarking of the standards of quality, and the increase in the Virginia retirement system contribution rates. We are uh, projected again to, to show a declining enrollment in FY17 of about 300 students. So the projections have been clear, and that certainly impact us, impacts us. We know enrollment is a significant driver of um, funding. So you will see, see those changes overall, about a net of 300 students down. And we provided to the board and now to council the last five years and the last four years of enrollment trends as well as the projection for the, the next year. So you have five years worth of, of enrollment data before you. Continuing, um, that loss of enrollment equates to about $1.5 million. But again, that begins to be offset by things such as the, the re-benchmarking as it relates to the standards of quality, as well as the shift now in the composite index. Our ability to pay, as, as presented in the, the governor's budget for the next biennium, um, we can pay a little bit less in terms of uh, the composite index. So we've gone from about 31 cents on a dollar to 29 cents on a dollar. So we, we've seen that shifting uh, based on the, the community revenue and tax information. So the impact of the lower composite index is an additional $2.5 million to the schools. That's, again, a significant piece. As we look forward in the planning, there now, when I say the 6.7 deficit that we began with, balanced by the 6.7, just so happens the 6.7 million in new revenue through the governor's proposed budget creates that balance in, in that portion of the budget. But there are other expenditure considerations that we have to face as with the district. Um, every 1% salary increase is a roughly, for staff, is roughly $2.5 million. The anticipated costs of the additional or the increase in VRS uh, contribution is one million. Additional state-funded instructional positions, where I mentioned that the governor has some additional positions, for Norfolk that would be $1.3 million that we would have to identify. We've also, in the last couple of years, the state has restored and required us to restore the instructional technology resource teaching positions, something that we had a very strong cohort of those positions before. And at some point, they were eliminated from the budget. But to continue to phase that in is another $1.5 million. Of course, our health insurance costs or increases are, are to be determined. We certainly, Dr. Thorne, with, with members of city staff, have continued to look at what those may be. And other general operational needs. So just in, in, in the last piece, again, we've, we've since updated our budget calendar that the board next Wednesday at its work session will have its budget priority setting session. And then uh, we will continue to work within the district with our uh, developing the budget. And we'll present a budget to the um, school board on March 1st, I think it is. I forget, this is a leap year, so it pushes the calendar in February. March 1st or 2nd, somewhere in there. And then every week in the month of March, the board will either be engaged in work sessions, public hearings, or other actions moving toward adopting the budget by the end of March so that we will meet the uh, requirement to have a budget submitted to the city by April 1st. So I just wanted to, to set the stage in terms of what we know so far. Obviously, obviously the legislature is, is, is in this work. And, um, digging out from the snow in Richmond so they can continue this work. And, they, you know, we wait with bated breath to see what the final dollars will look like. There are also a number of legislative pieces there that are challenging the public education, and we'll continue to monitor those also. So with that, I'd be glad to engage in discussion with the council and the board regarding any of what we presented. Um, Dr., I read the Washington Post article this morning, too. I think okay. it's about 800 less that the state is contributing to public education yearly that never got restored after the recession. Um, 
one of the toughest things to absorb was the fact that when they recalculated how they distributed the money, uh, it was to some degree based on uh, decline in property values. And of course, Northern Virginia, which is the wealthiest communities, their declines were sharper than, you know, down here in Hampton Roads or here. And so the wealthier communities actually wind up getting, you know, bumps in money. I mean, it has something mm -hmm. to do with the taxes, the tax production. So, I mean, that was really the toughest thing yeah. to, to absorb. That somehow needs, ought to be addressed. Uh, is there any hope, and I'm not going to grill you on your budget. I mean, oh, that's okay. No, is there any hope on the I federal impact aid will be? Uh, on impact the, aid? The federal impact aid may. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'll defer to uh, right. refer to, to Dr. Thornton because, the, you know, that's been up and down and iffy at best. So, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, federal impact aid has been um, up and down the last several years. One of the things that we're doing this year is we're working closer with the uh, uh, Jill Gables Jill. at that group to give us a little more support following up on the federal card process to make sure we grab as many of those families and students as we can into our account, which would equate to uh, funding. So in that respect, we've got more boots on the ground, if you will, to follow up on those initial returns of information that may be incomplete, and hopefully it will result in additional funding. Okay, that's what her goal is. That's why she's here, too. In, in part, yeah, that's one of the byproducts of this new partnership right. that we Camp have Allen with the coalition. All of those kids are, are, are dependent on our know, military to connect us. That's right. But only 40 or 50 percent of them are even handing their cards. Right. So again, one of those aha moments for me. I always remember the chase us working in the district and us chasing those impact AE cards. So we will get back to that with real earnest. Uh, any questions for Dr. Boone? Dr. Boone, when you come into a position such as an office that has had uh, turnover upon turnover at superintendent's uh, position, each superintendent before you has had some plan. They've either named it a particular name or they've had some plan that they've put out to the teachers and the students. Uh, where does it leave as you come in? And that, and this really is a leadership question, not necessarily what your specific, with specificity what your plan is. How do you step into the plans, let's say Dr. King had, uh, that he had briefed us on for the period of time he was here as to what he was looking to do? How do you come in as a new superintendent? Uh, do you pick up a book, read what his plan was, decide I like part of it or I don't like any of it, I'm going to throw it away? And then we have to go back to the troops, the teachers, and the other administrators. How does that work uh, so we can understand, and then ultimately what your plan will be into the future? If, does that question make sense? Absolutely. One of the, the goals that I have in order to address a lot of transition that has occurred in the schools one of the first things I've said to principals in my first week here, I spent three of my first four days in the district with principals because they are the generals on the front line and I had to understand what's going on with them. But I also had to talk with them about who I am as a, as a division leader. Those who were here when I before remember me as a chief academic officer and executive director. Sharing with them where are we in terms of, of a district. Everything in Norfolk is not broken, so that's my first assessment. Exactly. But there are some places that need a great deal of attention. And over time, there will be some places that I will be saying to the board that I need to have a different set of recommendations based on certain things that are in place. Obviously, the, the building construction, those, those things are already out the door and what that looks like. So let me give you an example. Richard Bowling Elementary School with this new construction was slated to, or is slated, not was, is slated to have um, a primary year's IB program, International Baccalaureate program. One of the things that I ask, and, and the team has been, been very open about what's been accomplished and, and, and what hasn't been accomplished, it was very clear that the level of planning that's necessary to apply 
for an international baccalaureate program had not occurred. As a result, it would place too much. The, the paper didn't quite capture this one correctly, so I'm glad to use this as an example with council. It's not that we're stepping away from the IB program, but it takes a lot of planning. And that school currently has a first year principal. They're planning for transition to their new building. They are a focus school from the state in terms of underachievement. And so to now suddenly compress into a six month window, what takes a lot of time to accomplish would not have been fair to that school just so I could say I'm delivering on primary year IB at Richard Bolton. So I reported to the board that we would start those conversations in earnest once they are moved into the building and once the school year has started. But I was not going to force that on the plate because mo first and foremost, we want that school to be able to show some success with its instructional programming under the new principal. And that needs to be our focus for the rest of the year as well as and while central office supports and the school develops its plan for transition to the new building and to get that open. So that's an example of how I come in and I assess where we are and what makes sense to continue, what, and then what are the other places that we need to put a pause on it. And again, in these first eight weeks, um, put a pause on the primary years IB. Going forward, I will be talking with the board about some other things strategically that I think I need to step away from in terms of overall success for the district. We did, there's been a lot of grade reconfiguration in the schools. Um, and so we need to make to see if the paired school model is really de delivering on the results that were expected through that. Um, how do we look forward going there's been a lot of uh, planning in terms of facilities, enrollment, and those things. What do we know with current data, and how do we assess that? So I always come into a district with the idea of everything not being broke, of being able to celebrate with our, with our staff the things that are working well, and to, as I said to everyone, and, and I started here today, I'm leading closer to the work, not as a micromanager, but really understanding what are the connections that we have to make to move things forward. And I, I guess it's a safe team for me to share my, they told me now, I think about a duck's, I call it foot, but it's called palmate. If you oh, think I'm about a duck, duck, right. So a duck has appendages there, right? But if you were to take your hands in a bowl of water and you just did like this, you only moving water through your through fingers. You aren't making progress. It's only when that webbing is connected to those appendages that we begin to get some forward motion and a duck does this and pushes the water behind them and propels himself forward. I'm working to build the webbing. We have a lot of appendages. We have a lot of things standing alone. And our goal is to build that webbing so we can get some forward momentum. I'm borrowing that. Uh, let me ask it's, you. It's trademark. I'll sell it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're broken North public schools. We're trying to make money. And, and you're coming for a budget. <laughs> Always. I think I just bought it. Uh, Paul, can I go? Yes, sir. Um, also, if you could, I, I think that when we look at success for the city, and I think, and also, and I'm looking at this from an economic development perspective, and I don't know your side of the business, but if it's possible, um, if you can, when you begin your planning and start looking at your own philosophy, implementing your own leadership. Uh, if you could begin, if it's feasible, where, and I believe with, with the board itself, where you want to be five years from now, 10 years from now, and 20 years from now, what vision do you see uh, and talk about that amongst yourselves so that we get an idea of so we can be part of that vision. I think that Absolutely. you can't do it in a vacuum. Absolutely. And it does require council to be a part of that, whether they're elected or whether they're appointed, whomever it is, regardless, we need to have that future together. So when you begin your planning process, please keep that in mind for us. we Will do, um, and, and let me say, we have begun that planning process. Okay. Um, you know, coming in the middle of the year is an interesting time for a lot of reasons, but Time is not on our side to begin to move some things. Any, you know, what are the things that we need to grab quickly and make some adjustments with? 
and then what do we look like going forward? I, the, the board has a set of goals that as I, when we've met, the, 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 the vision and the mission and those strategic goals that uh, direction that the board has, I'm certainly um, supportive of and don't need to, to redo that. And, you know, about, particularly about the schools being a cornerstone of a very diverse community. So I'm on board with that, so we don't have to spend time with that. We're now beginning to, what, it will, what will it actually look like going forward? And I hope to leave a plan for someone in 20 years, because I don't want anybody to tell me it's time to go home, because I'm too old. This will be so. one of your students. <laughs> yeah. Paul, I'll just chime in on I just yes. want to reinforce Please. that, because uh, part of what uh, we did as a board as uh, we were in the process of the superintendent search, we reaffirmed our goals, we reaffirmed our mission, we, we took another look at it to see if it, if it made sense as Dr. Boone came in. I mean, the board really sets that framework. And then we uh, do our best to get out of the way and allow the superintendent to come forward with recommendations for implementation. So we will continue uh, as part of working together as a governance team, both to set that vision, uh, to modify any goals based upon what the data and information tells us, uh, any strategic recommendations that comes from the superintendent. So I just want to make sure I reinforce from a process standpoint, the board has that responsibility in partnership with the superintendent right. to set that goal in the vision. And then it's the superintendent and her team that then goes forward with uh, implementation. And even as we worked on the previous version of the strategic planning team, and we were intentional about making sure that we invited uh, council members and members of the administration to be a part of that team. So just as we started out talking about the integration of the city's priority around lifelong learning and the work that the district uh, was doing, we could have as much integration as possible. And even the meeting that we had with your, uh, was it health education and welfare? Is that right? Welfare? Well, what is it? Used to, what is health it? education and families. Families, <laughs> health education. I think at one time used to be H-E-W. That was at the federal level. <laughs> <laughs> Even the dialogue that we were having there was really intent, intentional around how do we support one another, both from a policy perspective, but then we have the two administrations working together on the implementation side. And if it's possible, I think also from a budget perspective. Absolutely. Because I think we need to know what your goals are five years out, ten years out. We need to begin saving money, looking for money, making that part of what we're doing. All and, of the above. And then, but let's go <laughs> to the next step. One of the issues that I've run into since I've been on council uh, has, and, and I know it, uh, some people don't see it this way, but I, I call it truth in budgeting. Um, the last thing that I think as a council member we want to see is when we're on the dais at Granby High School and, and individuals from whether they're teachers, janitors, bus drivers, have to come down and ask us for a raise. I think that you all, you as the school board, out of my mouth. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I think yeah. that you, as a school board, need to consider that uh, before it gets to us, so that we're not dealing with requests that I believe the school board needs to consider when it comes to uh, your budgeting into the future. And and I don't mean to be this as a lecture. And I apologize, Dr. Well, Boone, if it comes across uh, no, that way. No, it doesn't matter. I'm uh, just going to give you back where we've already started that process. Okay. If you look on, um, let me find, on, on, on page six, the bottom slide, it said expenditure uh, consideration, the first budget that we've already included yes, is the cost for every 1% salary increase. So we're already in that, that mode of okay. thinking. I just want your, you. I want your teachers to, I guess it comes in communicating to them. Uh, one percent is terrific. No, that's not what we're saying. Mean, okay. Don't no. This is not saying that we're offering a one percent. This is saying that based on funds, now that we got that six point seven million dollars yes, balance, these are uh, some of the additional expenditure considerations, and the recognition that for every one percent of a salary increase. It equated it cost us two point five million dollars. So two this is five million dollars. That's correct. Three percent, seven and a half. Seven point five. Right. Can we, so. just say, can we just say this, Andy? There's not enough money in the school board's budget to be able to support a raise for teachers. If they wanted to give teachers raises, they have to start cutting staff and they have to start cutting programs. I disagree so, respectfully, Council. Okay. I'm trying to help you out here. Dr. You are, you are, but, 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 but let me tell my version of the story. There, there, there is some money there, but not enough 
to give the raises that are necessary to get Norfolk teachers back to where they should be. And we need to have that and so discussion. It, is, it does right. fall on council yeah, right. to have the, that conversation because it, we, we don't talk about it necessarily. And, and I'm not, I don't we even care ask. about raises for a minister. I'm talking about teachers in the classroom because Correct. that's where we're losing. That's where we're losing. And we're talking about everybody because, you know, one of the, the tough pieces that we deal with in education is there's a very thin bench nationally for secondary principals. And so one of the things I've already talked with the board about is the concept of having a pay and compensation study because we can read all of the articles about what everybody's doing and we can go attempt to put some dollars to it. But what does our structure really look like? And, and, and uh, Councilman Smeagol is exactly right. We've got to stop the revolving door on, on uh, teachers leaving us. Salary is but one piece of that. The other piece we own directly within the administration and that's the culture and the climate in which they work. And, and to go add to that, so Governor McAuliffe announced like it was this big thing that you know teachers are going to get this uh, one and a half percent raise. But when you start looking at the fine print, you have to remember one, it doesn't start until next budget year, so there's nothing coming up in this year to support teacher raises. And two, it doesn't include the non-SOQ funded positions, and the SOQs are already they don't deal with all the positions that you have to have in a school system anyway. That, and so you throw that back on a school, a, a tight school budget, and you got to get your bus drivers, your custodians, you have to get your teacher assistants. Everybody is not included in the SOQs a raise as well. And that one and a half percent becomes nothing. It, it just, it, it dwindles down. But I think as a council, it's hard to believe that I, I'm in my sixth year on city council but I can, there's one thing that I can count on during the budget process is Sabrina will present a budget, I'm picking on Sabrina, and there's always these charts and graphs that talk about how wonderful and great Norfolk is on how much they fund over all the other districts um, per Perfect. pupil. And I would like to ask our budget folks and Marcus and this council to reframe that conversation and stop putting that in the budget book because we've done it now for six years Okay, and there's going to be people that disagree with that and will say that we've got to spend more money per pupil in an urban school setting. It's, it, there's a lot more that we deal with on a daily basis. And let's talk about what's really needed. Let's not talk about enrollment has declined. I don't care that we're losing 300 kids, but j just as much as you lose 300 kids, we probably picked up 300 more special education students, which are harder to teach and there's more resources that are needed but there's no funding coming down from the state for that and so let's stop looking at that you can put them in there so but let's stop talking about it and let's talk about what the needs are in order to get our school district fully accredited and to get um, our kids across the stage at graduation and let, let's not metal we spend 11,000 per kid and Chesapeake does 10 I don't care about that let's talk about what is needed um, in order to make this happen. And if it means coming back to us and say, we'd like to give our teachers, our staff, a 4% raise, the state will do one half, we need another $6 million from the city council, then we've got to have that conversation. And it does fall on us, Andy. And that's what I'm Let asking. the teachers, let the people yeah. come to us and say they need more money. But we need to know. We, we right. need to well, know. I, I understand well, that. But I, what I, I, I was saying is this. We're limit. not getting I mean, it. When it comes to us at the right. budget time, it doesn't show that that's there. It ends up coming to us at the last minute when we're sitting at Granby's, you know, well, on Granby Street. That's the, that's the manager's proposed budget. And that's what we that need. Discussion. And what I'm saying is we need to have that discussion up front. We need to know what they want before we get to Granby Street. And if it was something that was declined by the manager's office, or if Marcus and Sabrina got together with the administrators from the school board, we've had this discussion at Gaines, then I want to know what got cut before it gets to Granby Street so we can have that discussion here before we have citizens come out there and stand up and ask for it. We need to have that discussion ahead of time. I want to know ahead of time what's been cut when it arrives. We're saying the same thing. We just need to honestly know that before and we get down there. Can, can I reframe it a little bit from the deficit model that it's always about what's been cut? Because I think that's been the pattern that when um, tough budget times, what do we cut? I take a different approach to budgeting through zero-based budgeting. 
And I use the example of a layered cake. You don't eat a layered cake by taking a slice, a, a layer off the top, and that's what you eat. You cut through all of the slices. So a budget has to reflect cutting through all of the slices. So it's not just about eliminating programs, but it, we, we will be making some adjustments, and we will be reprogramming dollars because in a no-growth budget, as we're in currently, based on what the governor's proposed, I have to figure out how to reprogram dollars. We will be very clear both to the board, to council, and the general public as to what the adjustments have looked like and, and where they've gone. And uh, I seldom ring my own bell, but I will on this one. The Worcester Public Schools budget won the uh, Meritorious Budget Award two consecutive years for the American uh, school business officials because of that alignment and that transparency around what happens with what we're trying to accomplish and what adjustments we've had to make and what are our core assumptions of how we get there. Well, I've been eating only the icing, Dr. Boone. <laughs> so, with okay, that being said, slice, okay. we, we, ex we expect that transparency. That's really what we're asking for as a council. We'll we're make you a nice we're begging for that. But, but we have that no, let me just add a little bit of reality here, Tom, Tommy, to what I think. Um, we live in a world that is driven by numbers, by data. Mm -hmm. you know, And that's how we're constantly held up. We're graded against uh, other communities. So I'm, I want that information. I want to know how much money. What I also want to know is how much the... The city is paying on a population basis how much we're contributing to the education of our children. I mean, I, I know you when you roll up federal aid and all that other stuff, sometimes we get a big number. Um, but then, you know, they start saying, well, how much are you really, how, how much is the city spending itself uh, for each child? And so I think we need all of that number. But just to say these are the needs and this is what we're going to fund and not look at how well we compare to other communities. I, you know, you're going to have to bring the community with with us. They're going to want to know that data if they're going to expect to uh, to pay for this stuff. I think Could you're I misunderstanding say, me. I think what you, what I'm saying, uh, Paul, is don't make that the driving question every time we talk about education funding, because every year Sabrina will stand up there with that PowerPoint slide and say that there's no more money to give the school system because we're their enrollment's declining, and you know we can only do these one-time funds. There's got to be a bigger conversation here because it's not about what we're funding over Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. We have different children that we have to and that's work hard on. So me too. I want all the information. You know, I, want, I don't want that to be the driving are, force, Paul. Right. It's every year. It's the it's the that is what is presented every year. Let's not present it this year. It's going to be in the budget book. Well, but we'll, why is that the driving question? Could I just are, everybody running for mayor is okay. talking about, and everybody running for city council is talking about. How they got to fund schools and we got to give teachers raises. Well, we got to do it. I mean, that's that's what you got to do. That's what we're asking. I know. Got to so put it in. Can I just? I'm not running for anything, <laughs> but I am running for some schools. I just like a little tiny bit of time. Um, I my concern. I understand what what uh, Tommy's talking about, just because I think sometimes our emphasis gets skewed. My bigger concern is there's a disconnect between what we get from the school system, and I've seen this on both sides, and what I get from the city. And I would love to have you guys have one graph that shows price per kid, whatever is necessary there, so that there's some consistency. And I know it's easy to manipulate the numbers, because you can look at different kids in different parts of communities, and obviously different communities that have different needs. But we do need, we can't be devoid of financial considerations and comparisons, but we need consistency. The other thing that I think we have to remember is that money is not the cure-all. I, totally, I totally get it with teachers' salaries. I, I understand that. But when we looked at why teachers left the system, very often it was not salaries, and it's other things that are important and we also have to be very careful to make sure that the money we are spending we have met the benchmarks that we've established and if we're throwing money for bad we need to be cognizant of that too so i need with the budget hearing um data that demonstrates where that money has gone that's worked and where we've gotten rid of, of expenditures because we've discovered 
So, you know, it's, it's more than just looking at money. It's more than just looking at salary. But the other thing that I'm, I'm a little confused about with talking about this budget here, I mean, you all tell us what you need to spend and how much you think you need to um, do a teacher salary raise. We get that. And then Marcus tells us how much he wants us to spend. And then, understandably, the public comes to us and says, please support the 4% raise or whatever that the school board has brought to us. So I think that's got to continue. I think those advocates for supporting the school board budget or that those aspects of the budget have to continue. And then we have to listen to that and decide where we go. But please talk to each other and give us one grant. Mamie and then the manager. Um, I just want to say this is good conversation. For, for me, we're actually sitting down to with each other and discussing. No reporting. Um, this is what we need. This is where we are. Um, discussing what it really meant by Governor McAuliffe saying that the teachers are going to get raises. Us finally discussing that and where we are. Um, in the past, the city council, we've discussed um, uh, finding ongoing revenue um, for the school system. And, and I'm not sure where we uh, are with that. I was really excited to hear that instead of the school system being involved with one-time revenue. I think that's, um, that's really hurting us. But at the same time, in finding revenues, I think that the city on our side of it we can be used as a resource. That really excites me, the partnership between the, the city and Norfolk Public School Board a, as being one. We can help each other out. Uh, Marcus and, and Dr. Thornton, you did it in the past. I think that we can now, with um, our new superintendent um, Boone on board, we can continue that ongoing conversation about how do we generate ongoing revenues because um, many people don't see Norfolk Public Schools as a business. It is a multi-million dollar business and we should be treating it as such. The, the other thing, and these are just some of the things that I see um, in being in the school, being the, the ground trooper and helping out any way that I can, when we talked about the declining um, enrollment of 300 uh, students, one of the areas that we possibly could uh, get better at is our daily attendance. That, that really concerns me if whether or not we are getting a true picture of children coming to school. For example, if I have a doctor's appointment and I come into school, are those teachers really changing my attendance once I get to school? The answer is not always. So that child is then uh, counted absent. And yes, that does have a reflection on how many students are, are showing up. So that's costing us uh, uh, money as well. Um, as far as the impact aid cards, we have parent liaisons in the school system. And, and maybe we could possibly figure out different ways of of getting these impact aid cards, but if it, it means that we have to come up with a, a plan of, of going door to door and, and just uh, meeting the parents uh, to get these cards back, then we're, we're willing to do whatever it takes um, to help Norfolk Public because that's a lot of money and I'm not understanding clearly uh, why we can't get those cards back. Um, so we. We can do it. I, I know we could, could take care of that. Um, Dr. Boone, um, I really do want to commend you on your comments about Richard Bowling Elementary School as well as all the schools uh, that we're building. If we're not ready, then we're not ready. It's better to prepare, discuss, and plan than to jump on the bandwagon and we're just not ready for whatever is uh, presented to us. And again, the, the, Terry, you mentioned the connection between the, uh, the city and the school system. I think that, we, yes, we can do a better job uh, at partnering together because the city has the resources. 
Norfolk Public Schools has the resources. We just need to make uh, time um, to sit down and plan. Mayor Frame, you mentioned about the, the report as well as um, Superintendent Boone um, that we recently have about that, all the money that Virginia was missing for the school system. And Mr. Mayor, you said that it was based on property values. Uh, a, a lot of it was based on yeah, property uh, values. There, there was a portion of it that mm -hmm. was being redistributed on the basis of loss of property values. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I, first time I'd actually read Yeah, that. so that tells us as a governing body right here, the, the city council, that maybe we have to take a look at how our future plans are as far as how we revitalize um, our communities in our city so that we're getting the, the most for our money so that we can then have another source of ongoing uh, revenue for our, our city. So that really interests me. And I, I think that, um, I think that's that's it, and I'm not running for anything. Okay, uh, Marcus, did you want to add yes. something there? And, and then I'd like to say something. Sure. Yes. Okay. So, you know, a, a couple of things, uh, Mayor, members of council, and uh, the, the school boards. I, I do believe that there is a, a great deal of a partnership and collaboration between the two administrations. So, um, part of me was going to sit on my hands because it just duck set this one out but I think it's important to, to say that and and it's very important it's almost like an NBA basketball game okay nothing goes on nothing goes on in the last two minutes is 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 worth watching because that's where all the action is and I think what happens during the budget time period is the last two minutes and there's a lot of doing that of that um, councilwoman Johnson you know summed it up you know sometimes what happens is there's budgets and then there are a couple of people that go into a room over the course of a weekend and, 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 and million, six, seven, eight million dollar problems go away. So I think that the thing that we, we I will commit to you, and I really enjoy Dr. Boone, I really do, and um, Sabrina and her work and relationship, the CFO, it's, it's, a, it's a good work relationship. I think a part of it is, you know, how can we not have the last two minutes of, of action as opposed to having the, the conversations up front about what's important. Mr. Ray. Yeah, I just got <clears throat> three things, uh, and I see you begin to do this. It's a tell your own story. Uh, the Norfolk School District has been beaten down so badly by the newspaper. You know, we got a gotcha newspaper in the pilot. And, uh, and I like the way you're telling your, your own story. Um, and they have beaten us down so badly that uh, that we need to push back, as I said several months ago, and that you need to tell your own story on the front end. And um, I also believe you need to raise the morale. You, you inherited this, and you need to raise the morale of all your employees uh, because they have been affected by the negativeness of the uh, Virginian pilot. Uh, and also, talk to us before the house catches on fire. You know, we in the past, you know, the, uh, the superintendents you know, just wait, 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 wait. You know, and I think you can see around the table that we are your friends and we want you to be successful. So push back on that old, mean, I mean, you hadn't even gotten here a day and Virginia Pilot, you know, started picking on you and I actually called a young lady, and, you know, and had, a, had some concerns about that. So we're your friends, tell your own story and just good luck. Thank you very much. Councilman Riddick, I, I really appreciate that. You know, the pilot in all of the transitions of Norfolk decided to send somebody to Worcester to find out about me, but they hadn't sent it to other places. And so I welcomed it. And just as I have done here, I met with the pilot without an entourage. Um, wasn't concerned about what was said because even as I've been here, there are two more data points that are very clear that no one can take away from my leadership in Worcester. One, the third of my four schools that had to be declared underperforming that had to be in state turnaround, turnaround that was announced in December. And just last Thursday, the state announced that Worcester's dropout rate had, dropped, had reduced to 1.7%, lower than the state's 2% dropout rate, and that our graduation rate, had, had four-year graduation rate had improved to over 80%. And when I got there, it was in the 60s. 
So thank you for saying about telling the story, and that's the story we're going to rebuild in Norfolk. And like I said, it's not about bells, whistles, and banners. It's about rolling up our sleeves and getting it done and taking care of the people who are helping us get it done. Okay. Paul That's Richard, a good just real quickly, thank you for your leadership. And at the last council meeting, I asked about um, our seriousness of continuing forward with the CTE school and how council can continue working on that. So I believe there'll be some kind of communication with right. you if that's still on your radar as an important priority that um, we'll hopefully be able to step it up um, and really let's start driving this forward so that the community is prepared for this. The CTE school, for those who've been to Worcester, including the mayor and Dr. Wibley and several others, know that um, the school in, in Worcester was a highly successful school and something that I deeply believe in because our role is to develop students' uh, readiness for college and careers. Some will go in directly into careers and some will go into college. But if you look at the pathway to college and careers now, they both look the same. And so it's about what choices students and families will be able to make, not whether or not they are prepared. And so the CTE conference, the CTE school is certainly something that I have um, picked up and engaged in the conversations and will continue as, as well as board members around the table. Um, I was just going to add that, you know, it was mentioned briefly in the partnership, but that has been ongoing. You know, Ms. Doyle has been uh, working on the committee, the manager is there. So the, that collaboration and partnership is is ongoing. It may not be something that is ready to, uh, you know, to, the banner out there, to right? diagram yet, but the sausage making is, is ongoing and it is a strong partnership. Tommy mentioned it, it as, he, as he said, Mayor Terry too, but maybe we could come in one day like at 2 o'clock on a day where we don't have a city council meeting and, and we're not pressed for time because we're already a couple minutes over and, and talk about the CTE school and Get all of us in here for a couple of hours, and we can all we can just figure out how That'd we can get great. this moving forward. That'd be great. Try to schedule some time, uh, or maybe on a Tuesday when we we don't have an evening meeting, uh, that uh, we can just talk about the CTE effort. So. All right. Um, I just want to add. Uh, I echo what Mr. Riddick said in terms of um, you telling your own story. I think that in addition to being qualified and all of those other things, one of the things that helps you is that people do know you. And so when people know you, they are more willing to get on board with you as opposed to a stranger coming from someplace else. As you can see, Marcus has been here for quite some time now, and we don't intend to let him go, but when we got him back, people were very... <laughs> <laughs> People were very happy to have him back here as a city manager because they knew him. So I would say to you to use the relationships that you have to your advantage. And we are here um, to help you. And as somebody who is running for something in May, um, the schools are very important, not just solely from a um, funding standpoint or teacher salary standpoint, but we could get a do-over with a lot of things. Worst case scenario, we don't build something right. God help us, we can knock it down and build it again. But you don't get that do-over with children and their education. None of us can go back to kindergarten and start all over again. So we have to get it right. And the children that are in our school system, you know, we have to make sure that wherever they are in the system and whatever it is that they didn't get, that we try to make up for that as they move forward. But that helps not only just those children, but the entire city of Norfolk. So we want to help you, and we want to make sure that not only, we want to make sure that you're successful, but by you being successful, our children are successful, and that impacts the entire city. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for giving us the time, and we'll, uh, we'll, let, we'll let you go. Mr. Manager, we're going to eat. Then we're going to go right in close, or what are we going to do? Um, we have the auditor that's coming in for about a 10-minute presentation. Okay. If that's fine, then we can and go then into the auditor. Yes. We'll go into yeah. okay.